Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be calling in from. Welcome, everybody. This is the Microsoft Graph Community Call for November of 2020. Today, we've got some great presentations that will be taking place. Uh, first one's going to be on Microsoft Graph and gRPC.net from our very own Christos Metzkis. And second will be uh, Microsoft Graph Toolkit from Elise Yang. Uh, so some great topics for us to cover today. Again, our agenda for the, uh, the items we have here. Uh, one quick thing we do want to make a call out for before we actually get into our presentations. If you are interested in presenting on the Microsoft Graph Community Call, we are looking for speakers, always open to any kind of submissions. If you are looking to present, a couple of things just to kind of call out for. Things you can include in an email would be you know, the solution that you're looking to present on or the topic area, what are the graph APIs that you'd be calling, and any other kind of platforms or services that might be involved in this. Sometimes we see people mixing together graph with Azure Serverless or with Power Platform or other kind of things. Um, just kind of get a good feel for what all is encompassed in the solution that you'd um, like to talk about. So if you are interested, feel free to reach out to myself, brian.jacket at Microsoft.com, as well as Jeremy Thake, uh, jeremy.thake at Microsoft.com. Feel free to write those down, um, shoot us over any kind of submissions, we'll review them and get back in touch with you if it's something that sounds like a, uh, a good inclusion for our community goals. And with that, I will turn it over to Christos and he can present on GRP uh, with Microsoft Graph. Sure, thank you. So I work as a developer advocate for the Microsoft Identity. So we sit inside Identity and we yeah, talk about, talk all, about things all things identity. identity. And this includes BTC, uh, Azure AD, and also Graph. We tend to uh, to do more end-to-end -end scenarios as possible. So rather than just talking about the Identity component or the Auth component, we try to educate people about how they can build end-to-end -end solutions, which is usually something that we lack across documentation and samples. So if you find gaps, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, I, I also uh, host with uh, JP, my partner in crime, a Twitch stream every Monday and Friday. We go on the four to five show for two or three hours every time. We have guests sometimes and we build things live. So if you are a, a developer interested in how you can integrate identity in your solutions, whether you're using Azure or AWS or on-prem or Google Cloud, as long as there's an identity component, as long as there's a graph component, we're more than happy to uh, show that. So we build lots of different things. Uh, feel free to check us out. Uh, it's usually around 8 a.m. Pacific time. And we love uh, talking to developers, having you as well. So if you have something interesting that you build with Graph or Azure AD or B2C, then reach out to us. We'd love to uh, showcase your solutions and see what exciting stuff you're building. So today I'm going to be uh, covering Identity for developers, um, the, the latest stuff that we are going to be covering is around .NET. And uh, we had two major announcements in that space. First of all, it's the ADAL to MSL uh, change. So uh, I don't know if you heard the news, but ADAL, the older library that we used to um, have for the Microsoft Identity Platform is being deprecated. So as of uh, June 30th, 2022, ADAL will be out of support. So one of the things that we always talk about and we want to highlight is that if you are using the Microsoft platform today to grab tokens and speak to other services like Graph and what have you, you need to make sure that you start the migration process. If you have any issues or if you need support, please feel free to reach out to us to help you with the migration to MSAL because MSAL comes with all the goodness of the V2 endpoints and it's a lot more advanced than ADAL and we want to make sure that you're compliant and up to date. The second big announcement in the .NET space is around the Microsoft Identity.Web, which is the new library designed for ASP.NET Core apps and wraps around through the MSL library and helps you with all the things that have to do with authenticating users, grabbing their tokens, and speaking to other services. Uh, so in the past, uh, there were multiple libraries, especially if you were in the ASP.NET space. Um, you had to authenticate users. Uh, and that was usually using the uh, ASP.NET identity system. So even though you were using Azure AD behind the scenes, there was a different system to uh, authenticate users. And then if you wanted to speak to other services like Graph or your Azure uh, storage or other, other services or other APIs, you had to go and download MSOL, which made things a little bit confusing. Uh, it was also defaulting to Azure AD v1 endpoints, which was also uh, something that we wanted to avoid and getting tokens, managing tokens was always confusing. Now, if you were creating APIs, th there was a, an additional complexity on top of that because 
You had to manage the middleware for the your JWT tokens. You had to also uh, work out how to do on behalf of. Uh, so it was always complex. So what we try to do is uh, create a, a single library that uh, abstracts all the complexities, gives you one-line solutions to integrate authentication, one-line solutions to a pull graph, one-line solutions to uh, implement CASIS, and it hides all the complexity. You, you still have the capacity to obviously look into or hook into specific events in the middleware if you want to, but for most part and for most developers, the 90% of those developers out there, they just want to integrate with the identity solution and move on. So with that, Microsoft Identity Web is a great solution. So for people that are wondering where that library sits, obviously Microsoft Identity Web is the new solution. It GA back in September, so you can go and download the latest NuGet packages and add them to your ASP the core solutions. And as you can see, all the individual components that you, you had to work in the past are still there, are still hidden behind the scenes, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but so surface them. So if if but if the default settings or if the default functionality in identity the web does not fit your needs, you can always go and look into how you can create custom cookie authentication or extend the JWT uh, bearer authentication or what have you. So from our perspective, we wrap around MSL, we hide the complexities in the .NET space, and we make uh, working with the identity system and graph super straight uh, straightforward. So. In the uh, on the left hand side, you can see how uh, the old code used to be for ASP.NET. I don't know how many .NET developers we have on the call, uh, and apologies if you're not a .NET developer. But the good news is that if you like what you see here, especially on the right hand side, then you you can let us know, and we can start working on making Java and JavaScript and um, Python libraries that we have for MSL work in a very similar manner where we abstract a lot of the complexity. So if you find this exciting, every time I speak to .NET developers, they jump with joy at the end of the presentation because we take away a lot of the code. We hide it behind the scenes, so you don't have to worry about these things. So if you like it and you say, oh my god, I wish I could do the same with JavaScript or TypeScript or Java, then this is the, the, the opportunity for you to speak out and let us know. We're always open to feedback. So in the left-hand side, there is a little bit more code. There is uh, there there are specific events that you need to tap in, especially for CASIs and what have you. And uh, on the right hand side, you can see uh, we abstracted everything behind a single line of code for most of the components. So uh, you can easily add authentication. You can easily add the ability to acquire tokens and call other APIs. Uh, and we're following best practices around .NET. So everything is happening in the middleware. Everything is uh, happening through the, the standard uh, injection of uh, services and registering those services and inject them into controllers. So you don't have to uh, you know, follow a different pattern than everything else. So authentication becomes one of these components that should be fairly easy to implement securely and correctly using the new library. And I, th I think uh, talking is cheap and showing actual demos it, it adds a lot more value. So uh, since I'm in the developer advocacy team, I like to play around with different solutions. And since Microsoft Identity Web has been a lot in the discussions lately, uh, what better opportunity for me to try and test how I can uh, use it with gRPC? So if you haven't used gRPC, or if you don't know what gRPC is, it's, it's, a, it's an open standard that allows for low-level communication between services. So it, it's a way for us uh, to write very low level services with very low latency and super fast performance. And it's, it is an open standard. So we, we thought, how can we integrate gRPC with .NET? So there's a gRPC.NET version that allows you to write a gRPC services using uh, C Sharp and .NET. And, and since it's running on top of the ASP.NET core component, I was like, wow, that's a great opportunity for me to see how I can break it and see if I can add Microsoft Identity Web there because it would be great. And then I didn't want just to do authentication since it's a service, I wanted to call into graph. So on, on this demo today, I will walk you through the process of how this uh, this was implemented. And uh, there are a few things that have changed since I, I wrote the, the, the demo, uh, in, in particular, the fact that one of the limitations of gRPC is that it, can, it couldn't run as a web service. So it runs as a service that you can speak to directly via HTTP2, but uh, you couldn't host it in, inside a web app. Now we have the ability to actually host it inside Azure, 
uh, web apps or you can host it as, a, as an actual ASP.NET service. So even though it was running on top of ASP.NET, it was not accessible via a browser, but now we made it available via a browser. So the demo I'm going to be using is uh, is going to, actually let's, let's switch to the demo rather than me talking about it. Let me show you what it does. So here, let me make this bigger so everybody can see it. And if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I'm interruptible while I'm discussing this. So uh, we have two, two components here. We have the gRPC client and gRPC service. So le first let's go to the gRPC service. We'll open this in Visual Studio Code. Uh, you can use Visual Studio as well. You don't have to use Visual Studio Code just because I'm using it. Anything that supports .NET, in fact, you can do it in Notepad if you want to. That's the beauty of Face in the core. Uh, so let's open this one. Let's go through uh, the code implementation. What, what did I have to do to uh, add authentication to my gRPC service? So every call that comes in needs to have a bearer token that calls the service. In fact, let's start with the necessary libraries. So we have the gRPC ASP.NET Core, which is the library that wraps around the gRPC service and allows us to work in .NET. We have the web, which uh, provides the integration for the authentication. And then down here, you'll notice that we have a new package called Microsoft Identity Web Microsoft Graph. This is a new NuGet package that allows us to uh, easily integrate Graph into ASP.NET. It's not specific to, um, to just uh, gRPC. So if you are writing ASP.NET Core apps today, you can call, you can add this uh, library for Graph. And we made it a separate package because some people might say, well, I don't want to use Graph. I don't want to have all that uh, overhead in my uh, identity library, which makes perfect sense. But if you want to, uh, to use it, there's an extra package. So with these two packages here, this is all we need for the authentication. Now, if you go into uh, program, there's nothing here. So that's the, the vanilla uh, ASP.NET uh, core middleware that starts the program. And in here, uh, this is where the magic takes place. And let me just make this even a little bit bigger. Uh, so we have uh, services at gRPC. So this ASP.NET middleware only deals with gRPC. We don't have any views or anything else that can show user or users can interact with. So it's a service. And then we're adding the Microsoft Web API authentication because this is a service. So it's more like an API. And because we want to call graph, you'll see that we have a single line here that says enable token acquisition to call downstream APIs. That means that any call that comes in uh, has to be authenticated and then the middleware will make sure that we also acquire the necessary tokens so we can go and speak into our graph. So this is the graph over here. Uh, this is the one that ejects the Microsoft Graph uh, client into our middleware, and we can call it later on. I'll show you how to do it. And then finally down here, we're adding a token cast because we don't, because since we're calling graph on behalf of the incoming call, we don't want to be going back to Azure AD every single time to validate our token. So it will cache it for us. And then down here, we need to ensure that we add our authentication. So uh, in, an incoming call needs to go through the authentication pipeline and, and validate that the user is authenticated. Uh, now, uh, a little bit of a side note here uh, for when you work with gRPC, you need to define the contract. Uh, uh, gRPC has this kind of a strongly tied contract between the client and the service and they both need to abide to the same contract. So if I change things here, I also need to change them in my client. And this is what, what uh, in effect exposes the API interface to the clients. And um, .NET Core has built around this protofile. This is the, the open standard, the gRPC standard, has built the, the support for compiling services that can uh, work around this gRPC. If you've ever done um, I don't know, um, all the services like W, uh, like Whistle, uh, if you generate the APIs from JSON or from back in the day, WCF, then uh, this is a similar kind of functionality where we create clients at the back or services at the back of the proto file. And here we have a counter request, which uh, means that, uh, well, this is pretty basic, but what I'm saying is that uh, a call will come with a counter request passing a name. And this is the name here. And then at the response will include a calendar reply, which will have the subject, body, start and end dates of the of my calendar uh, item from graph. So this is very basic and just builds around the calendar API on the graph. So 
I have a service which wraps around that functionality. This implements the uh, the graph call. Uh, I have a required scope, which is the expected scope that needs to be passed into my uh, graph API. You'll notice that here I'm injecting the graph service client. This is available to me via the middleware through this uh, line. I'll go back here. Let me just go here. So this uh, add max of graph injects uh, or makes available my graph client via dependency injection. So I can uh, inject my graph client I don't have to pass any authentication headers or whatever. Uh, and then the magic of verifying that the user has the right scopes happens here. This is part of the Microsoft Addendum web. If you've ever had to validate tokens, if you ever had to make sure that the incoming call has the right claims, back in the old days, you had to write about 20, 25 lines of code that has all been hidden away for you. And it does it with a one liner. So it's super exciting, super easy for me to validate my tokens. And if uh, if I had the required scope, which I passed up here, uh, access as user, then as long as I have the right scope, then I can execute the call. And you can see here, we're executing the get my events and uh, select a specific subset of the data I want to grab back. And then we're creating a calendar reply. This calendar reply is what the protofile defines here. So that's a strongly typed object that has been created at the back of the protofile. And then I return that back. And we can actually run this, and then I will show you what the client does on on the other end. So let's uh, let's open the terminal. And let's call .NET Run. This is how you can execute calls. .NET. You can also use the debugger here if you want to uh, to do that. And while this is happening, I'm going to switch to my client now, the consumer of the gRPC service. So uh, CD, there's the client, and I'll open this in different instance of the code. So right here, you'll see that um, the middleware here is kicked off, and uh, it's running, and it's listening at port uh, 5001 for the service. Now let's go back to our client and see how the client has been implemented. So this is a console app, very basic. It could be a website, it could be a, a different service, uh, anything that can actually call into that. I made it a console because it's uh, quick and dirty. I know, not the, the best way to showcase stuff, but it is what it is. Now, something important here uh, is that we're actually setting the same profile. So somewhere here, I am passing the uh, profile. Oh, you know what, I think it's in the in the CS Proj file, yep. So uh, down here, I am pointing my protobuf into the same uh, proto. Now I could have copied that file across, but it makes uh, um, changes harder because I have to copy the file all the time. This is the, the piece of code that instructs the uh, gRPC service in .NET to actually go and create the strongly typed objects and to work with. And you notice so we have the gRPC tools again, the gRPC client factory, and the protobuf. These are the standard uh, gRPC components. And then down here, I've added uh, Microsoft Identity Client. So because this is a console app, we cannot use Microsoft Identity Web. So we need to rely on MSAL to do the authentication for us. And for that, I'm using uh, Microsoft Identity Client, which is the client library for authenticating against Azure AD. Uh, inside my code, uh, it's uh, one file, so let's hide this for now. We have the, everything is happening in main because I'm lazy and this is not the best design, but what we do here is we use device code authentication. So um, we'll use this flow to authenticate the console app, we'll grab the token, and then we are going to call, uh, create a channel to our gRPC service. And then we're creating um, this graph client, sorry for the bad naming here, but this graph client is the gRPC graph client, not the actual uh, graph uh, client they get from the graph SDK. Um, and that confused me as well because I named things badly. So uh, the graph client is the gRPC service, and then I'm, I'm actually adding the author authorization um, header here because I need to make an author authenticated call. The token is the one I acquired from uh, MSAL. And then I'm, I'm making a calendar request and we're waiting for the gRPC service to come back and give us the, the response. And then in here, I'm just writing things down. 
So let's uh, let's go and run this and see it in action. So this kick off our uh, our call. As you can see down here, I already said uh, you need to authenticate first before you can use the the app. So I'm going to click on this one, follow the link. So there you go. Let's close this one down. There you go. I'll add the code. And I think I used. Oh no! What happened? The request tokens do not match the user context. Is it because I had a, an authenticated user already? Let me see. I might need to clear my cache. Sorry about that. I tested the demo the other day, so it was working fine. Next. Come on. Don't embarrass me in front of my audience. Thank you. OK, so we signed in. And then when we come back, there you go. Let me just make this bigger. The gRPC call has executed. It found two calendar events with a start date of that and start uh, end date of this. I think it's only one right now. Monday morning meeting. There you go. Uh, so it could have enumerated all the calls I had. And uh, this is it. If I go back to my other instance of VS Code, you'll see that the call has executed here. So we got the HTTP request post to the endpoint. It grabbed the token and validated the token. It, uh, it made everything correctly, and then it responded back with uh, executing the right endpoint in gRPC and it come, coming back. So uh, this is it, uh, a few lines of code to implement authentication end to end. I think overall, I didn't write more than, uh, I think the gRPC component was more complex than anything else. The authentication code and the call to, to graph were all done with uh, maybe five lines of code. So uh, it's super easy with Microsoft Addendum Web to get started. Uh, but it doesn't mean that this is the only right way. As long as you use our libraries or any OpenID Connect library and grab the access token, it's easy to call um, services. Uh, one of the questions I get is why should I use gRPC over, uh, say, a web API or, say, an API build with functions? There are some added benefits with gRPC. First of all, it's uh, super modern and super fast. Uh, it provides to strongly typing um, services and clients, so it's easy to generate those uh, out of the protobuf files. And I think that the fact that it operates at a much lower level than uh, standard um, APIs means that you get much faster performance. So that's that's one, one way to create services, modern services these days. So if you haven't used uh, gRPC before, then I would urge you to have a look at that. Uh, it's fully supported in ASNA Core. Microsoft at the end of the web makes your life so much easier. And hopefully, uh, walking out of this, you'll be able to uh, grab that information, start implementing your own fun stuff. Are there any questions? Feel free to uh, put your messages into the chat window, or if you want to come off mute, you can also do so. One question I did have for you is, I saw that you did the include in your project file in the client. Does that mm -hmm. mean if you update the server side that you then need to rebuild the client to be in lockstep with that? Yeah, you need to do a uh, .NET build as part of the process. Uh, now, when you do .NET run on the local machine, it always builds first before it um, runs. But if you change the if you change the proto file to include other things here, then obviously you'll need to add the, the necessary code. So if I if I were to add say uh, a, a, a team API component, like I don't know, get status or user status or uh, presence, then I would need to get a presence request and a presence re response. And then I will need to extend the services and the clients to include the necessary code. So for like a production deployment, though, you'd be OK to roll out the server side changes before the client side? Or what if you had like conflicting changes in there? Sorry, I didn't answer the question. So I'm just curious, like most times if you're adding things to the server side you're okay because the, the client doesn't even know about those things but right what if you were like let's say taking away some properties or you know making a breaking change on the server side mm -hmm. how, how would you make sure you roll that up to the client so that they have like in lockstep the same updated version with the server side right so uh you need to make sure that uh, both the client and the service look at the same profile right because this is what defines the contract so as long as your client points to the same profile, 
that's why that's why in this instance I'm sharing the same uh, location for the file. So I only have one file, which is the single source of truth for everything. That file can live anywhere; it doesn't have to live inside your solution. Obviously, it makes it easier if it's inside the solution. Sure. But if you have a if you have like five different clients that speak to the same proto service, then uh, ideally you need to find a way to share that uh, file across all the clients and the services. Gotcha. Yeah. I see Daryl is on the call. Thanks for uh, chiming in, sir. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, there's a blog post as well that accompanies these, and we made the source code available on GitHub. So if you want me to share those links, I'll be more than happy. If people want to see how they can build their own stuff with gRPC and graph, then uh, everything I have here is available online for other people to look at. So hopefully that'll be useful. Excellent. Yeah, if there's cool. no other questions, um, thank you so much for your time today. This is a uh... Great demonstration presentation. Really appreciate you coming on today. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. All right, with that, uh, Elise, you're up next. Would you like to present from your machine? Yes, let me present. Hi, um, I'm Elise Yang, and I am the PM for Microsoft Graph Toolkit. Um, so today, I wanted to show you the design specs that we have for three new components that our team is looking to add to the toolkit and um, get your feedback on our implementation and any, take any questions or thoughts that you have on our design. So if you're not familiar with the toolkit yet, the toolkit provides a library of components and helpers that allow you to integrate with Microsoft Graph um, super easily and quickly. And if you want to quickly learn more, then I would suggest going to our playground at mgt.dev. Um, so for these three new components, um, they're all using the OneDrive and SharePoint APIs to allow you to integrate files experiences into your apps super quickly. And these components are kind of like our first step towards creating files components. So right now we're focused mainly on enabling um, the basic rendering of files as well as file selection. So this is the first component that we have. This is our basic file component and it allows um, you to retrieve and render a file from the signed in users SharePoint or OneDrive. So this implementation is very similar to how our person component in the toolkit works today. You're able to specify the file that you want to get from graph by a couple of ways, you can either provide the full query to the file, like in this first example here, or you can provide a combination of identifiers. For example, like you could provide the drive ID and the item ID, or the site ID and the item ID. Um, and the component will like compose the request and send it to graph. And then as a developer, you have control over how the file is rendered and what it looks like in your application. So you can use the view attribute or property to determine like if you want to show just the name of the file or if you want to show additional properties you can show either one line or up to two lines of text. You also have the flexibility to set the properties that are shown in the rendering. So you can set line one property and line two property with the details that's returned by the drive item resource. And the next component that we have is the file list component. Uh, so similar to how our person and then our people components work together, this does the same where the file list component is using our file components to show a list of files. Um, so similar, you can also specify either the full query to a drive or a site or a folder that you want to show the list of files from, or you could also specify an insight type. So if you wanted to show the files that are most relevant to the signed in user, you can specify either trending, used, or shared as the insight type, and the component will retrieve the list of files from using the insights API on graph and only show the files that are relevant to that user. And yeah, you have the flexibility to control how many files are shown. So if you wanted to show only like the top five trending files for that user, you could easily do that. And then the default for this component, if no identifiers or any query is provided, will be to show the user's root drive. And then the last component is file picker. So this kind of provides a very basic file picking experience for the signed in user, 
Um, it'll have a button with a drop down that shows a file list with the option of the user clicking see all, which will kind of open up more full fledged file picker experience that's similar to um, the React file picker control or the PNP file picker control. So similarly to the file list, you can specify either the drive or the site or folder that you want to show a list of files to pick from, or you could specify an insight type. So if you wanted to show the users most recently used files so that they could select it and do something else with it, you would provide like the recently used insight type. And you can also enable or disable multi-select. And as a developer, you can access the files that the user has selected with the selected files object. At least we have one question from the uh, chat window on here. Yeah, I can take that now. Sure. So from, uh, I think this is the file list control, uh, Ofer is asking about, what about filtering for files? Is that supported with um, this control? So filtering, I think you, you would be able to do it if you use the full query and you provide like the OData filter query and filter that way. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so those are the three components that we are thinking of adding. Right now we have them, the full specs open as issues in our repository. So you can provide feedback there and also see kind of like the full list of what attributes and properties we're proposing to add as well as other functionality. And our repository is at aka.mgt. And if anyone has feedback, questions, thoughts, I would love to hear those now. Um, one question I did have was, I believe on the MGT file component you were talking about, uh, you had site ID and list item in there. Is that using the SharePoint uh, IDs or is that using the OneDrive files IDs? Are you talking about here in these examples? Correct. So oh, you actually, could yeah, provide. Supported. Yeah. So depending on what, like if you provide the developer provides drive ID, then we would build the UR the request towards OneDrive, and then if it's if the site ID is provided, then we would send it to SharePoint. Gotcha. Okay. I missed the, the distinction between those two. And do you happen to have these things in the uh, MGT Dev uh, Playground, or because they're still uh, <laughs> in preview, they're not there yet? So these are kind of just like our proposed designs, and we wanted to get some feedback from the community and developers before we actually go and implement this. So right now, it's not in the playground, but if you go to the issues, this is how we are kind of looking to collect feedback. So here in this issue, we have the full spec with all of the supportive functionality, some examples of how it would be used, all of the attributes and properties that are available, the APIs and permissions that will be used. And yeah, if you don't have any questions or feedback now, but think of some later, then you could leave a comment on this issue and we will get back to you there. You get the, the first format for the 703 and then you can link to the uh... 704705. Yeah, they're all linked, so you should be able to find them pretty easily. All right. If no additional questions or feedback, um, thank you, Elise, so much for your time. This is great to see with the uh, graph toolkit and adding in more support for new components. Um, I know we've, we've seen a lot of requests for people to expand this once they've gotten a chance to play with uh, MGT. Yeah. Excellent. All right. At this point, um, we've got about 10 minutes or so for open forum. So if you have any questions related to Microsoft Graph, Graph Toolkit, any other services uh, related to Microsoft Graph, feel free to raise your hand, put your questions into the uh, chat window, and we'll see if we can address any of those uh, today on our call. Andreas has, looks like a question here, um, returns just the file or also the display URL like in the Teams files? Yeah, what's for least because let's say uh, it happened to us, we build it the same UIs like Elise. And when you when you have the file, you have to decide what you do with the user. You want to send him to a, a proper formatted UI. And let's say when you want to send him to Teams, you want to send him into a chat window with the file and not into the SharePoint URL. That was a question. 
So you want to send the URL to the file and not just the file? Let's say when you have a file picker, the question is, what is the next action? Do you want to download the file or do you want to work with the file? Yeah, and so... If you want to work with the file because somebody selected it, you would like to have a, uh, the best looking UI that Office 365 offers. And that could be so sometimes right SharePoint, that could be sometimes Teams files. Yeah, so right now for the kind of like our V1 of this component, um, when the user selects a file, it'll be added to the file, the selected files object, and then as a developer, what to do from that file from there. So like if you wanted to build additional functionality to do something with that file, that would be up to you as a developer. And I think to add a little context to um, Andres' question, it's um, kind of around the nature of deep linking to files. Through just working with various customers and partners, we've seen scenarios where you can get back like the web URL for a short file, but if you want to deep link to it inside of Teams or the way that Teams represents that URL, I don't believe we expose that as a property or something else on Graph today. So there's been a couple of requests for that, like I want to get the display view or what's what's the URL to get to it inside of another client. Is that correct, Andreas? Yes, that's that's correct. Because let's say when, when you work with the Graph API, people want to, to do similar things than they do in the normal client. Yeah, so right now we are looking at, like we'll only be able to use what's exposed by drive item in Graph. So if that's not yet exposed by the OneDrive and SharePoint APIs, then we wouldn't be able to add that functionality yet. And I, I believe we have this as an open um, feature request uh, to the, the SharePoint OneDrive folks. Um, I'm not sure about on the team side, Fabian, if you have anything to comment on that. Same thing on the team side, we have it as a feature request. Um, there's some, uh, Andres and I have been talking about this for some time right now, and um, we have um, a meeting schedule, actually we're working on the, to schedule a meeting next week um, with some of the PMs that are actually working on this. Great. A uh, question from Vincent around uh, Microsoft Q&A versus Stack Overflow. Um, so for those who are not aware, Stack Overflow is not a Microsoft pro property. Um, basically, it's a third party that we host a lot of our questions on. So across all of the M365 kind of ecosystem, um, open and available for people to ask questions. There is a separate site that we're developing almost to replace the TechNet forums, MSDN forums of days past, and it's called Microsoft Q&A. The Azure team and a few others have already onboarded to Microsoft Q&A, but not all other teams are currently there yet. Uh, one of the improvements that we're going to get by going to Microsoft Q&A is because we own the platform, we'll be able to actually have private conversations. So a lot of times when a question gets raised, it's a, hey, can you go and look at you know my tenant or can you go and look at this specific you know, piece of my code or some kind of sample? And if it's on Stack Overflow, we can't actually share those kinds of um, you know, confidential secrets or, or things because it's not our platform. Um, when we do get to Microsoft Q&A though, that will be a way for us to actually say, hey, here's the question. We can actually dive into a private chat with whoever the requester is or commenter, be able to kind of you know, share those you know, PII kind of things and not be violating any kind of data, uh, you know, uh, privacy kind of things. So to date, we do not yet have the Microsoft Graph category on Microsoft Q&A. Um, but look for some announcements for that in the coming months. We'll have more to share once we get into the new year and, and more stuff has been onboarded. Question from Brandon, how far along is support for managing B2C users and their strong auth methods in Microsoft Graph API? That will actually be part of our um, identity uh, Azure AD team. We'll take that one as a, uh, a follow-up to bring up with our identity and security folks, because even though we are all Microsoft Graph, there are kind of subdivisions in terms of who manages which requests and so forth. So, uh, so Hill's asking, app credential flow requires a call to a server-based app uh, to Graph. Can you explain a little bit further on that one, Sahil? Just in general, you would not necessarily require to have a, uh, a server-based application for that. You could make a application credential flow. Um, so basically not a delegated user flow, but a uh, application permission one. Those are supported for doing from a client. So if you happen to have, you know, console application or your workstation, you could run that flow from uh, a non-server machine. Um, and in that sense, you would have access to, you know, uh, securely encrypting a secret or having a certificate for your authentication mechanism for it. So 
would not be a hard requirement to go to a uh, server-based application for that, I think is what you're getting to. But if you can provide any more details into the chat window or come off mute, please do so. Right. If you want to, feel free to follow up with us afterwards so that we can get some more information on that. Tyler's asking about if we can get intermediate 404s on known active users when my application queries on behalf of a user when reading mail from a mailbox. First call will succeed. Second will go to 404. Third will succeed. Anyone else experience this behavior? That sounds so. It'd be helpful if we had like a request ID and a uh, timestamp to actually see what the queries were. Usually, when you get a 404, that's going to be like a couldn't find the resource. So I would check to see do you have the correct format or the correct user that you're querying into, um, just to make sure that those kind of things are actually finding the resources that it should be. But if you want to follow up afterwards, um, see if we can actually track down what the uh, specific nature of those 404s are. It'll be probably something we can take offline. And I see Alan and Anoop are both pointing over to the uh, docs. Yes, so if you happen to deep search into it, there is preview support on the Q&A platform, but we're not fully you know, publicly announced on that, so didn't want to share too many details just yet. But if you happen to search for it, you will find something out there. Any other feedback, comments, or even things that you'd like to see in future community calls, feel free to put into the chat window and we can see if we can get uh, presenters or any other kind of topics like that included on our uh, agendas. If nothing further, we'll finish up with our last couple of slides to round things up today. If you're interested in joining the Microsoft Graph Tap, um, this is a, um, a program that uh, our customer and partner experience team does run. As part of this, you gain benefits like having a monthly tap call where we do uh, cover NDA kind of material. Um, so if you're looking for kind of the previews of what is coming with Microsoft Graph and all the kind of related services, uh, very much appreciated for folks uh, joining into this. You can find the link down at the bottom, aka.ms graph tap form. Um, we review submissions on usually a, a weekly basis or so, and we'll get back to you uh, based on uh, reviews of those things. Uh, other developer community calls to be aware of, we do have a number of them related to Microsoft 365. Uh, there's a bunch of links on the top of the page here. If you want to get to the like, kind of one-stop shop for them, aka.ms slash m365 dev calls, and you can find links to many of these different ones, whether it's depth of cards, graph, identity, uh, teams, power apps, and so forth. Uh, lots of great content that gets covered on a monthly basis. Also calling out our very own Jeremy Thake, who presents with our other friend, uh, Paul Schaefline, community MVP. Um, they talk about a lot of different topics related to M365. Recently, we've had things on publisher verification, like stuff to do, Power Platform, and so forth. So feel free to uh, join into the podcast and listen in on new and exciting developments in M365. Uh, we will be hosting the recording for this on our YouTube channel, aka.ms slash M365 dev YouTube. Feel free to find that on there. And just a note for our next uh, community call will be taking place on December 1st, 8 o'clock a.m. Pacific time. More details to follow with that uh, as we near that date. And with that, we'll wrap up the recording. I do see a couple of additional questions in the chat, and we'll answer those after our uh, session concludes here today. So once again, thank you everyone for joining into our November 2020 Microsoft Graph community call. Thanks so much for your participation, your questions. Uh, very helpful for us to um, have all that. So with that, thank you and have a good day. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you.